So thanks again for coming. We um, Today, we have one of our members, Kate Midas. I'm really excited because uh, I love uh, their, their work and the things that they show. So um, I'm just going to give a little intro here. So Kate, for a better part of a decade, Kate Midas worked um, at Seller Story Bookstores in Providence, Rhode Island, Blue Jacket Books in Xenia, Ohio, and Tavistock Books in Alameda, where I, Alameda, California, where I first met her, uh, before founding Kate Midas Booksellers in 2017. She's a member of the ABAA, ILAB, and the Ephemer Society of America, and is independent, and also the Independent Online Booksellers Association, IOBA. She sells ephemera, books, archives, and vernacular material in a wide range of subject matter with an emphasis on women's and social history from the 19th and 21st century. Um, so excited for Kate to be here today. And um, here she is, Kate. Take it Hi, over. everyone. <laughs> um, so can everyone hear me? OK, cool. Um, so I am going to talk today about um, mostly about how to catalog and research ephemera, but I am going to delve into archives a little bit. Um, and if it's all right, I'm just going to share my screen now so you all can see this very simple PowerPoint I put together. Um, okay, hopefully you all can see that now. Thank you, Lizzie. So yeah, so um, just to sort of preface this, I just want to say that uh, this is just how I do things. It is not necessarily a comprehensive uh, approach. It is not necessarily even the best approach. It's just a way that I have found um, to deal with this material that tells a really good story, I think, about it. Um, so first off, I just thought I would start with um, what ephemera is. I think. Um, a lot of, oh, well, let me back up a little bit. So um, not everybody I know deals with ephemera. I happen to love ephemera. I got, I got kind of started with ephemera because I was working out of my bedroom and I didn't have a lot of space and ephemera doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, and I also fell in love with it when I was working at Tavistock. Um, so that said, um, I still don't know a lot of like the different types of ephemera. So one really good resource for for that is this Encyclopedia of Ephemera by Maurice Rickards, um, which gives you a really good breakdown of all the different types, whether you wanna know what the difference is between a boudoir card and a cabinet card is, or you know, you name it, it's, it's in that in encyclopedia. Um, and in that um, reference, uh, Rickards defines, or one of his definitions for ephemera is minor transient documents of everyday life. Um, I have crossed out the minor here because I tend to think that ephemera is not minor and, and especially because right now institutions are really looking for, um, for ways to fill in gaps in their holdings that aren't necessarily books. And ephemera is a really good way to, to do that. And it can tell a really big story or become, you know, be really important. So I've crossed out minor here. Um, and when I do get ephemera um, and when I'm, I'm researching it or trying to find out what it is, um, and I think I'm gonna just jump ahead real quick. So um, I think maybe a good thing to start with actually would be to talk about what, what we're doing when we're cataloging ephemera. So um, this is just a, a very sort of simplistic breakdown, but um, basically, when we're describing something, we're working with five basic questions. So what the material is, um, not just the title, but the type of material, what its physical description is, uh, when it's from, so we're, we're placing it historically, uh, where it was, was published or created, because obviously not all of this stuff is going to be printed material. Some of it is going to be manuscript or, um, or you name it. Um, it could just be visual material, graphic material. Um, who created the material and who it's by or for or about. And ultimately, why is it important? What's the story? And, and why, is, why does somebody want to buy it? Because that's what we do. We're booksellers. We're trying to convince people to buy this material. So um, when we're working with that, um, sorry, um, 
usually uh, a really, so these are just some search tools that I use to try to figure out when I, when ephemera doesn't have all of that information on it, because often it doesn't, unlike a book, which you often see title, publisher, publication date, all that information can be readily available, which it's not always with ephemera or our archival material or vernacular material. Um, so this website um, is just a really, you, you guys might want to just check it out. There are tons of websites like this, by the way, um, that give you Google search tips. So whether that's um, using a, a tilde to find synonyms for what you're looking for or using a hyphen to subtract certain words. So um, to give you an example, I was looking, uh, I was trying to find out some information about a series of broadsides that I am going to be bringing with me to the Boston Fair. Um, and it's about this theatrical troupe called Mason and Dixon. And Mason and Dixon is incredibly hard to just Google because you get so many different search results, um, which is really frustrating and not very helpful. So one thing I did is when I was Googling it, I would put Mason and Dixon in parentheses to make sure that, um, or am I using that? In quotation marks, I'm sorry, in quotation marks to make sure that just those words were being searched. And then I put a hyphen and the word line to get rid of all the references to Mason Dixon line. Um, so just these little like very simple ways of like using Google to your advantage will be beneficial. Um, another tool I use, uh, which is really helpful is ancestry.com. Um, so these, the next three, these three are all um, subscription, paid subscription sources, which kind of sucks but they are really useful. So I, I definitely recommend that you all make, make the investment if you're gonna be dealing with this kind of material. So Ancestry is really good because it provides um, all sorts of census records. That's often what I find it, what I find I use it for. So if I have, um, you know, uh, sorry, I can jump ahead. Sorry, if this is really disorienting. So for instance, with this um, item, which is a bound volume of the shuttle, a newspaper for cotton mill workers. Um, I the editor was a woman, um, and let me just like look at my notes real quick because I'm going to get her name wrong otherwise. Um, her name was um, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. Ethel Thomas. Okay, so Ethel Thomas, and. Um, and I was able to find in the census records that she is listed as a textile newspaper reporter um, in the census records up until 1930. So I was able to say in my description uh, that this newspaper was edited by a former, so in, in another census record, she's listed as a weaver. So you can, you can fill in the gaps in people's histories by looking at census records. Uh, you can find out the, of course, their birth and death dates. Um, you can also find out information from city directories is in ancestry.com. So it's a, it's a really useful resource. Um, newspapers.com comes with ancestry.com and you can get, and I, I recommend getting the newspaper extra as well because um, you get more newspapers that way. And it, um, this is another invaluable resource for searching or researching um, ephemera and archival material. Um, because you can you can find ways to um, again fill in the story. So uh, if you have something that happened on a particular date, um, uh, an event, a party, uh, something like that, that's on a broadside, say, you can search in newspapers.com for the location, uh, maybe some some keywords and the date that you're looking for. And maybe you find a newspaper description of that party, and then you can put that in your description, and that that helps fill in the why something is important. Um, WorthPoint is really good, um, just as a way of checking. So the one thing that can make ephemera really frustrating for some people to deal with, um, besides the fact that you can catalog like thirty pieces of ephemera and barely make a dent in the pile of stuff on your desk. Um, which is untrue for like giant sets of books. But um, the thing with ephemera is that often there, there just aren't any comparables and you have no idea how common something is. So WorthPoint, which is really just checking eBay records, um, 
is a good way to just see how often something has come up and been available. If you can't find lots of records of it um, in the history of eBay sales, that's at least a good indication that maybe what you have is fairly scarce. Um, so that I think, uh-oh, screw up, uh-oh. Oh, have I like not been showing? Yeah, okay, well, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So let's go to verifying your information. Um, uh, so this is a really important thing, I think, for when you're cataloging and researching any sort of ephemera archival material, stuff that doesn't have um, often a bibliographical resource that you can go to. That's not to say that there is no information you can find. There are lots of books published. There's lots of even Google books that you can pull up just from a Google search. But you can't go to your, um, I don't know, Sabin say, and pull it down and find a, that somebody else, you know, that Sabin found uh, such and such number of copies of this particular book, et cetera, and, and its number such and such in the bibliography. And therefore, you have, you have done your research and, and somebody can find that. So in a way, when you're dealing with ephemera, or archival material or what have you, um, you, ha you kind of have to build your own um, uh, evidence base. So you have, to, you have to figure out like, okay, so what is this? How do, I, how do I prove that? Who did it? How do I prove that? So basically every time you're coming up with these um, various, oh shoot, I can't scroll. Oh, there we go. Um, various aspects of, of your description, you have to prove it often enough. So um, I'm having difficulties with my transferring. Sorry, give me one second. Uh, um, hmm. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, so um, First question I always ask myself when I'm looking up information is, are my sources trustworthy? So if I go to Wikipedia, and um, sometimes that's that's the, the that is the first place I check. Just if if it's somebody who's well known, they have a Wikipedia page, that can be useful. Um, do I trust all the information on the Wikipedia page? Absolutely not. Um, usually, what I do is I is I actually go to the sources that are used in the Wikipedia page. And I check those. So if they're citing newspaper articles, if they're citing magazine articles, I pull up those sources and double check the information in the Wikipedia article. Um, another way to check uh, if your sources are trustworthy is just simply, are they professionals in the field of research that they're writing about? So um, often published books are, are you know, by professionals. They've been fact checked, et cetera. Those are pretty good, reliable resources. A random web page by a um, blogger might be accurate, but you can't necessarily just trust them with the same level of trust. Um, and that brings me to this sort of hierarchy of accuracy. Um, the American Press Institute has a really good website all on sort of journalistic um, how journalistic practices that can that that translate a lot to what we do as booksellers. So they talk about the hierarchy of accuracy um, as saying, you know, some facts, quotes, and assertions and color are are more reliable than others. Um, stuff that comes from an eyewitness is obviously better than stuff that comes from sec than stuff which is secondhand. And stuff that you know for yourself is better than the stuff someone else supposedly checked out, or did they? Um, and then once you have um, sort of gotten some sources, have you fact checked them? So um, again, that sort of goes back to what I was saying with Wikipedia, where I actually go and check the sources they cite. Um, to give you another example with those broadsides um, of the, it was a the Mason and Dixon broadsides. Um, on the broadsides themselves, they sometimes say that the performers are African-American. And they don't use the word African-American. I think they use all sorts of other words like colored and Negro and things like that. But I'm just going to say African-American. And, um, and I was really excited because I thought, oh, this is really interesting. This is it was mostly broadsides from Europe. It's this African-American 
theater troupe doing variety performances in Europe in the 19th century. Like that sounds pretty cool. Um, and I looked up, um, and again, so newspapers.com, I looked in that and American newspapers were incredibly hard to find uh, good information on because there's so many articles in American newspapers about the Mason Dixon line, but they performed in London and in the London newspapers, interestingly, I found um, some accounts of their, um, their performances where uh, they were said to be Negro or colored or what, you know, any, any of those terms. Um, and, but not all of them did. And so I, I was questioning that and I thought, well, let me talk to someone who is much more knowledgeable about 19th century um, African-American performance artists. And so I did, and he said he hadn't heard of them, which seemed unusual. So he pointed me to the Clipper, um, which is sort of the main theater newspaper or magazine um, from the 19th century or that reported on the 19th century uh, performers. And from that, I was able to find the names of Mason and Dixon, trace them in the census records and discover that they were not African-American, they were black face performers doing minstrel shows. So if I'd just gone with my original hunch or even with that like first uh, sort of confirmation from the London newspapers, I would have been selling something mistakenly um, on the basis of it being an African-American piece when of course it was not. Um, that doesn't mean it, it has no value, but it does change uh, how I sell it, who I sell it to, what I sell it on the basis of, et cetera. So when you fact check stuff, I always kind of think of it as triangulating evidence where you at least have two sources that are coming together to support your argument. Um, if you just have one, you're kind of standing on one leg and you're liable to fall over. Um, the other thing sort of uh, just goes along with that, which is to examine your own assumptions and biases. Um, it's really easy in this business to sort of just uh, think that because we've handled something similar, we might know what the next, you know, what, what the thing in front of us is. And, um, and so, yeah, you always have to question, question your own thing your own arguments and make sure there's the evidence that you're coming up with can stand up to somebody else following in your trail. Um, which leads me to a personal bugaboo and not everyone agrees with this, but um, in the trade, there is the, the possibility or the tendency, I don't know what the quite, well, quite what the right word is, um, but it is a, a common thing where people say when you buy when you buy this item, you buy the description. And there's a really good article about uh, sort of why, why not to just rely on your colleagues' descriptions uh, by Lawrence Worms in his blog, The Book Hunter on Safari, where he, uh, the, the particular title for this blog is called Assertive Cataloging. And he traces how a mistake was copied from uh, one bookseller to another, and this was all bibliographical information, somebody miscited an edition and made the, the particular copy they were selling sound much more valuable than it really was. Um, so that's a bibliographical reason. Um, another example is, and this is from when I was working at Tavistock, um, and again, this, this gets into, uh, I, I feel like determining the race of somebody is um, particularly since uh, there's so much interest in African-American material right now or uh, other ethnic groups material right now that it can, it can do a great disservice to the material to misdetermine the race of uh, the people that are, are creating the material. So in this case, when I was working at Tavistock, we bought some, some letters um, that were purportedly by a group of African-American soldiers to an African-American woman in I think uh, Tennessee maybe, uh, during World War II. And um, they'd been purchased from another bookseller. And I think the, the, the bookseller we got them from just sort of assumed that the bookseller they got them from had either known who sold these or just knew more about the material. And so they said, oh, yep, by, by an African-American group of people, here you can buy them. And so we bought them and I was doing research. And again, I just checked 
um, Ancestry.com. There's also Fold3.com, which is um, for military research. And uh, again, discovered that uh, the, the people who were writing these letters were not actually African-American. Uh, somewhere along the line, an assumption had been made, uh, and I, I don't know why, um, and, and that mistake got uh, perpetuated. So it's really easy for mistakes to get perpetuated. I'm not saying that, that uh, descriptions from your colleagues are not valuable, but uh, I, I'd say the watchword is always just trust but verify. So you always wanna, you know, you can use that as a, as a great resource. You can use it as the basis, but always do your own research, always double check information when you're putting it into your own words to sell it, uh, you know, on, under your own accord. Um, so now I thought I would just show a couple of items of ephemera um, that were particularly rewarding, I think, to, to research. So. Um, this is a cabinet card of Annie Hindle, who's sort of known as the first uh, female to male impersonator in the American variety stage. Um, she also managed to marry two women in her lifetime, um, legally, even though she was dressed up as a man and gave a man's name, they, she would later live with these women as women. And, um, and I got this not really knowing anything about her and was lucky enough that a book um, by Jillian Roger called Just One of the Boys, uh, Female to Male Cross-Dressing on the American Variety Stage had been published and that talked a lot about this. And so just by doing, um, doing a little Googling, doing some researching, I was able to discover that there was a, um, a book that gave me some more information um, and uh, I don't know if I should say this, but anyway, Jillian Rogers ended up being the one who bought the photo for me. So <laughs> it all kind of worked out. Um, another piece um, is this Hanlon Brothers Volvel. Um, and this one, I was able to find some theater magazines that talked about the show, the Phantasma, and also about the artist uh, whose face is represented here. Um, let me see, his name's George, um, George H. Adams. And they talk about how he's, he's particularly known for his extreme facial uh, impressions. And this Volvel is literally just pictures of his face as he's holding this screaming cat in a particularly terrifying way. Um, and, and so again, that just helps me like fill in the story, fill in the gaps. Um, we already talked about the shuttle. Um, so this one, this was interesting. So this is an archival piece. Um, this is the manuscript diary of a North Vietnamese Air Force pilot, um, largely written during the Vietnam War. And um, what was interesting about this is I don't know Vietnamese. So I ended up having to find somebody to uh, translate or, and not even like translate word for word, like translate the gist of it. Um, and when you do that, you basically have to tell them how to how how to catalog something, and that that's a that's actually a really helpful exercise. So in this case, I had uh, the translator go through. So it's it's mostly in poetry. It's not all original poetry. So I had him go through and and tell me how many how many poems there actually were. How many of those poems were. Um, uh, original, um, because when you're dealing with our archives or or material like this, you have to you have to get the, the details down, right? The physical details, like what is it? How much is there? Uh, how many illustrations are there, etc. Um, and then I I had him go through and uh, basically anytime he he made an assertion that was uh, at all not a fact about the diary, he had to support that with a quote. So he would go through and he would say he was very excited to join uh, to join the, the, the Air Force. And then here's a quote from the diary that supports that. So um, teaching somebody how to, how to catalog is, is really useful and also helps you understand how you catalog because most of the time we kind of just do this thing and it, and it works for us and putting it, articulating it is, is the, the tricky part. Um, and the last thing I was gonna show um, is this Ellen Armstrong poster. So Ellen Armstrong, 
uh, was the first uh, African American woman to headline her own magic show in the US. So she's a pretty cool lady. She started working for her dad when she was six years old in his show. And then when he died, when she was 25, she took over the show. Um, and what was really great is when I was, I was Googling about her and I, I found some information mostly on, um, there were some blogs, there were some, and I tried to sort of back up the blogs with some other information. I think there was something on a library, library's website. And then I found an article that was interviewing a guy named Hanif uh, abdur Akib who wrote a book called Little Devil in America, um, which is all about black performance in America. And he has an, a, a section on Ellen Armstrong in that book. And I was able to get that book out of the library and discover like all about her, um, how her show works. Um, now in that case, do I check everything that Abdur Akib said was in her show? No, because I'm assuming it was a published book and that somebody else fact checked it. Um, and end of the day, there's only so much you can do because the one catch about ephemera and archival material is that it does take a long time sometimes and you have to factor in your time plus the value of the material. I've certainly been guilty of spending, you know, a half an hour, an hour longer on material that really doesn't justify that kind of effort. So it's always a, it's always a push and pull. Um, and, and that's, I think, all I kind of had to say about that. I figured if we wanted to open it up to questions now, that would be, that would be fine with me. It looks like we have one question from Bill Allison in the chat uh, that he put in there. And he wants to know, do you cite your sources in your descriptions? Um, I do generally, yeah. Um, I, it's, I, I always, if I, especially if I put a quotation, I always put the, the source for the quotation. And then um, often when I, um, like with this Hanif Abdur Akib, uh, Little Devil in America, I think I put a reference at the bottom saying like for, you know, for further reference, see this book. Um, so yeah, I always, I think just like in journalism, you have to be transparent about your sources. Um, we also have to be transparent about our sources again, so that somebody can follow, follow up what we've done and verify it for themselves. Awesome, thank you. And if anyone else has questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask in person, or you can drop it in the chat and we will ask uh, Kate for you. Um, so we'll give folks a few minutes. Um, also, sorry, everyone, I didn't realize I was not in presentation mode with my little no. thingamajig. So no, no, no. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Where, yeah. where do you source and find most of your ephemera? Oh, that's super secret. I'm not allowed to tell Is it, is it a secret? Okay, see, guys, I'm not a bookseller. I don't know the rules on, on the secrets. Uh, no, I mean, I, I get it all over the place, just like everyone else. I get it from other dealers. I get it from flea markets. I mean, you name it. It's, yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite, like, thing you found at a flea market? Like, unexpected? Surprise? Oh, totally. I got this amazing... Um, this guy was selling a bunch of cookery ephemera and that he had this amazing cocktail volvel uh, where you turned, you turned it, it was like shaped like a bottle. It was beautiful. It was designed by a woman uh, whose name I'm forgetting right now. And when you turned the volvel wheel, it gave you a new cocktail recipe and it was just absolutely darling. It was in perfect condition. And I think he sold it to me for like $2 and it was just mwah, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay, Madeline Johnson once says, um, thank you so much for this. How do you recommend locating comparable items in institutions as another marker of scarcity? Or do you find sources like WorthPoint uh, that gauge market scarcity to be adequate? I'm familiar with Archive Grid, but I often find it clunky. That's a really good question. So, um... Finding ephemera in institutions can be really tricky because a lot of times if it's there, it's buried in their finding aid um, at best. So a lot of times uh, you kind of have to just go with your gut. You can search Archive Grid, you can search OCLC for the titles. Often when I'm searching OCLC, I do it in the most broad way possible so that at least I can say, um, 
I don't know, maybe a, a collection by this particular artist who made this piece of ephemera is being held in an institution. And then in that case, I would say in my description, something like um, possibly held in the collection at such and such institution. Cause that's kind of all you can do sometimes. Uh, if, you, if you have something that's really valuable um, and that, that merits this kind of effort, um, it might be worth contacting the institution that might hold the item and asking if they can verify that it's in their collection or not. Um, but uh, that's usually a step that I find is not necessary to take just because I don't, I'm not dealing with like $200,000 pieces of ephemera usually. Usually it's a much, much lower price range, so. Awesome. Uh, Jennifer Phillips asks, who is your go-to vendor for archival supplies for ephemera? Oh, totally eGerber. Um, I know they have like a huge long waiting list right now. Um, and it's like really, I think it's like a 10 month delay before people are getting supplies, but they're the best ones out there. Awesome. Uh, Raquel, who's one of the mentees in our mentorship program asks, how long do you think a description should be? I, I mean, I tend to think that most descriptions for most things um, unless it's a unless it's an archive an archive where you're detailing lots of different pieces of it um, or something something really complicated for the most part my descriptions are a page or less um, if it's I, I think that the longest I've gone to was probably with that uh, Vietnamese diary and I think that was like five pages and that was because I was taking all these chunks of chunks of translated material and describing it and all of that but yeah usually a page I mean technically the description is as long as it needs to be um but every now and then like if you have something and you realize you're writing way too much about it you're gonna you're gonna have people's eyes glazing over when they're reading it then you got to kind of trim down so Terry Osborne who was our last presenter said say just enough to sell the item which excellent advice you know, could just be a price <laughs> I don't know um any other questions from the from the audience? Anything you'd like to share with us or with Kate? Um, or Kate, anything you any you know final advice or, or perhaps your your guiding your top guiding principle for for how <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Uh, I don't think I have like a top <laughs> guiding principle. I would say that there's a lot about verifying your sources and, and making sure that what uh, what you're selling is what you say you're selling. Mm -hmm. um, that I think I think we as a trade could use to talk about some more and could use to share you know share tips about more because I think um, I think one thing that scares people off with ephemera is that it is um, it is time consuming sometimes to deal with and. Um, and also there's not always easy ways to, to verify that what you have is, is what you say it is. So I think, I think we have a, a ways to go as a trade until we're like really sharing that information and everybody feels comfortable handling ephemera. And, and I think everyone should feel comfortable handling ephemera because it's like the coolest stuff out there. So. <laughs> is, there, is there like a piece of like gateway ephemera, you know, or like, like oh, when you the start gateway to dabble drug. into. <laughs> that um, area uh I would say actually so this is this was when I was working at Tavistock and it wasn't really just a piece of ephemera it was an archive that included a bunch like 24 diaries plus a bunch of ephemera about this guy from Illinois who wound up moving to Leadville during the silver boom and becoming a miner but like he he actually didn't do a lot of the mining he baked bread and then he got involved in the women's rights movement. And so there was all this, all this really cool stuff happening, all this cool ephemera. It was really jazzy. And, and just learning about all of that from, from the diaries and from the material, um, there's something just really like that gives you an immediate high when you're dealing with primary source material and discovering the story and then being able to share that and hope that other researchers are gonna be able to use the same thing that you just found. So, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Libby Ware, is there a good source of how to identify different types of photos? 
So I am not the greatest person to ask about how to identify different types of photos. I am not. Um, I have, I can pull up, a, I can make a list of the various books that people recommended to me at one point when I was looking for a way to identify different types of photos. Um, I don't have them at hand, but yeah, they're, they're much better people to ask than I, I will admit that. Cool. A few people are suggesting Bags Unlimited as a good supplier of uh, Mylar, uh, and there is no current waiting list. Uh, I believe it was Lizzie Young who suggested that one gateway could be menus, uh, which is very interesting, works on paper. Uh, also great for knowing what people uh, enjoy at certain times. I learned that at one of the book fair uh, to one of virtual book fair tours. Um, cool. Oh, so yeah. there are no other questions. Can I can I interject? Absolutely. And just to answer the um, photography question, there's a wonderful course at Rare Book School um, taught by Gawain Weaver, who is a photo restorer um, and kind of expert in the field. And I took it in California, and it, he is it was the most useful rare book school course I have ever taken in terms of actual hands on knowledge um, about photo identification and processes and the history of it all. Um, and I highly recommend his course if it's still being taught. And he gives you a really cool packet and lots of identification worksheets so that you can go home and go oh yeah that's a collodion print. Um, so anyway. Cool. And James Goldwasser suggested uh, Gawain Weaver and also Elizabeth Svensson as a possible uh, brown bag lunch topic. So that's great. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Kate, for sharing all of that incredible information with us. Um, stay tuned for information about our next uh, brown bag lunch next month. Um, as always, if you have any questions or feedback, you can get us at hq at abaa.org. Org. Um, and you're welcome to turn your cameras on, unmute, say hello to Kate uh, before logging off. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>